from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. You have in the program a great deal of details about Natasha Trethewey, and I'm not going to repeat them except to acknowledge that of the highest awards in our field, including, for example, the, poet, uh, the Pulitzer Prize, that's what she received for her last book, Native Guard. And we know her very much as a poet. And while we will hear her poetry today, we're also going to hear something new from her as listeners and as readers, which is her prose. Like Natasha Trethewey, I am a child of Mississippi. And when considering how best to introduce her work with its focus on a people and a place and time, I naturally thought of the writers of our state. I thought of the parallels between her work and Faulkner's regarding the land as a living character, wealthy on the courage of the individual, Margaret Alexander Walker and Richard Wright on the testimony and even the rage of the submerged voices. But I found an equal linkage with Robert Frost and their mutual care for the poetic turn, for the shaped note of knowledge revealed in the space between two lines of suspended revelation. Robert Frost stated, poetry is a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. And when I think about what Natasha's achieved here with Beyond Katrina, that's what I think of. This is a stay against that impoverishment. It is a stay against that forgetting. She says one line from a quite wonderful poem that hopefully we might hear. She says, bring only what you must carry. And clearly she assigned to herself that hardest of task. She decided to carry the story of a region and a tragedy to a region and her honestly a neglected story of the Mississippi coast. And this was a burden she gave herself and she carried it to the heart. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome Natasha Trethewey. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I, I'm delighted to get to uh, read a little bit of poetry and prose to you since I am in the poetry and prose tent. This book is in many ways a hybrid itself. Um, because I am a poet, I couldn't help sticking a little poetry in between uh, all the prose that I was writing. Uh, the book is an attempt to remember my hometown and the other hometowns along the Mississippi Gulf Coast that were devastated during Hurricane Katrina. I began writing this book because I used to go around the country giving readings and before I would read from my last book of poems, I would ask people what they remembered when they heard the words Hurricane Katrina. Always they said New Orleans, almost never did anyone say the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The poem is dedicated, uh, the book is actually dedicated to my brother Joe. It tries to uh, trace the rise of, the, of tourism and the gaming industry on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, the kind of development fomented by the gaming industry, and also the kind of environmental destruction that went along with it. It's interwoven with a story about my ancestors who arrived on the Mississippi Gulf Coast around the same time that the city of Gulfport got its charter. And it ends up being a story about my brother and his life and what happened to him in the wake of the hurricane. A story that I think becomes emblematic for the kinds of suffering that people who are often invisible on the coast have endured. I'll begin with a poem from the book that also is the, the first poem in my last book. They're both the first poems in both of these books because the, 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 the poem underwent a kind of revision after the hurricane. I had turned this poem in to my editor of March, in March of 2005. It was a very figurative meditation on the impossibility of going home or those places we've left behind not because the places are gone or forever changed, but because we are. By August 29th of 05, this poem became literal. Theories of time and space. You can get there from here, though there's no going home. Everywhere you go will be somewhere you've never been. Try this. Head south on Mississippi 49, one by one, mile markers ticking off another minute of your life. 
follow this to its natural conclusion, dead end at the coast, the pier at Gulfport, where riggings of shrimp boats are loose stitches in a sky threatening rain. Cross over the man-made beach, 26 miles of sand dumped on the mangrove swamp, buried terrain of the past. Bring only what you must carry, tome of memory, its random blank pages. On the dock where you board the boat for Ship Island, someone will take your picture. The photograph, who you were, will be waiting when you return. Somewhere in the post-Katrina damage and disarray of my grandmother's house is a photograph of Joe and me, our arms around each other's shoulders. We are at a long-gone nightclub in Gulfport, the terrace lounge standing before the photographer's airbrush scrim, a border of dice and playing cards around us. Just above our heads, the words high rollers, in cursive, embellished, if I am remembering this right, with tiny starbursts. It is 1992, the year the first casino arrived on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and with it, a new language meant to invoke images of high-stakes players in exclusive poker games, luxurious suites on the penthouse floor, valet parking and expensive cars lined up in a glorious display of excess. Scenes from a glamorous casino someplace like Monte Carlo or Las Vegas, nothing like the gravel parking lot outside the club, the empty lot beyond it, and the small run-down houses on either side, each with a chained-up dog barking into the night. Not far from the club, beyond the spot that held the old Gulfport City Limits sign, is the neighborhood my ancestors settled in when they arrived on the Gulf Coast. Roughly five miles north of the beach and downtown, the place called North Gulfport was once the northernmost settlement beyond the city. One of two historically African-American communities that sprang up along the Mississippi Gulf Coast after emancipation, North Gulfport has always been a place where residents have had fewer civic resources than those extended to other outlying communities. Isolated and unincorporated, North Gulfport lacked a basic infrastructure. Flooding and contaminated drinking water were frequent problems. Although finally incorporated in 1994, not long after the arrival of the first casino, many of North Gulfport's streets still lack curbs, sidewalks, and gutters. Before the arrival of the casinos brought tourists down Highway 49 toward the beach, there were few streetlights, and North Gulfport was cast in darkness. When I was growing up there, North Gulfport was referred to as Little Vietnam because of the perception of crime and depravity within its borders, as if its denizens were simply a congregation of the downtrodden. Even now, it is a place that outsiders assume to be dangerous or insignificant, rundown and low income, a stark contrast to the glittering landscape of the post-Katrina beachfront with its bright lights and neon bouncing off the casinos onto the water. Were North Gorkport not along the main thoroughfare making it necessary to drive through to get to the beach, it might easily be forgotten. Witness. Here is North Gulfport, its liquor stores and car washes, trailers and shotgun shacks propped at the road's edge, its brick houses hunkered against the weather, anchored to neat clipped yards, its streets named for states and presidents, each one a crossroads of memory marked with a white obelisk, its phalanx of church houses, a congregation of bunkers and masonry brick, chorus of marquees. God is not the author of fear. Without faith, we as victims. Sooner or later, everybody comes by here. In the year leading up to landfall, a few miles up Highway 49 from the beach, my brother was beginning work on the shotgun houses. 
The boost in tourism brought by the casinos had created a greater need for housing. North Gulfport had finally been annexed, and the strip of Highway 49 that ran right through it was undergoing a great deal of development. Where there had been darkness for so many years, streetlights appeared, guiding travelers from the beach to Interstate 10, past the Walmart, fast food restaurants, motels, gas stations, and convenience stores, up to the new outlet mall. My brother's property was right in the middle of it, most of it at the crossroads of old Highway 49 and Martin Luther King Boulevard. For years, the shotgun houses Son Dixon had built languished in a state of disrepair unpainted, sagging, many still occupied by tenants who'd been there since he was alive, the rest vacant and sometimes sporadically occupied by drug users. The remaining tenants had paid the rent, now up to $250 a month, steadily for years. Miss Mary in the duplex at the corner of MLK and Arkansas, Chapman's Fruit Stand and AD's Bell Bond Business at Old Highway 49 and MLK. Armed with tools and experience, Joe began repairing each one, putting in new floors and carpet, new countertops and appliances, brushing on a good coat of paint. Miss Mary nearly cried when Joe fixed up her house. Each day, whenever he was outside, someone would drive by, stop, and roll the window down to look. People kept coming by to say thank you, he told me, and man, I appreciate what you're doing for the community. For many longtime residents, it must have seemed as if Son Dixon had returned in the form of his young nephew. By the start of the summer of 2005, nearly all of the houses were renovated and rented. In a few months, with a profit, Joe could get them insured. Katrina made landfall on August 29, 2005. Out in the Gulf, Ship Island was completely submerged, the storm surge up to 27 feet. Mississippi officials recorded 238 deaths. Tens of thousands of people were displaced. Even though she was a renter, Miss Mary had lived in her duplex for nearly 30 years. She survived the storm in it, but before long, she'd have to leave as the severely damaged structure began to fall down around her. Hearing her story, I thought of Bessie Smith's backwater blues. When it thunders and lightens and the wind begins to blow, there's thousands of people ain't got no place to go. The kind of repairs her house would need, Joe couldn't afford to do. He'd spent all his savings on repairing them prior to the storm. Before the second anniversary of landfall, the city would demolish the duplex and my brother would be struggling to pay the taxes on vacant land. Watcher, after Katrina, 2005. At first, there was nothing to do but watch. For days before the trucks arrived, before the work of cleanup, my brother sat on the stoop and watched. He watched the ambulances speed by, the police cars, watched for the looters who'd come each day to siphon gas from the car, take away the generator, the air conditioner, whatever there was to be had. He watched his phone for a signal, watched the sky for signs of a storm, for rain so he could wash. At the church, handing out diapers and water, he watched the people line up, watched their faces as they watched his. And when at last there was work, he got a job on the beach as a watcher. Behind safety goggles, he watched the sand for bones, searched for debris that clogged the great machines, riding the prow of the cleaners or walking ahead. He watched for carcasses, chickens mostly, maybe some cats or dogs. No one said remains, no one had to. It was a kind of faith that watching my brother trained his eyes to bear the sharp erasure of sand and glass, prayed there'd be nothing more to see. After my initial journeys back home following Katrina, I stayed away for a long time, though my grandmother asked again and again to make the trip. I know I can't live there anymore, she'd say. I just want to see it one more time. 
For three years, I kept putting her off, saying one day, so that at 92, she could at least hold on to the hope of getting there. I never considered the consequences of this tactic, how it might haunt me later. When I started going back more often, it was because I had to, and by then, it was too late. It occurs to me now that I had been waiting, foolishly, for the recovery to be complete. I had wanted to show her the place she'd spent her life without the narrative of destruction still inscribed on the landscape. During the year or so after the storm, everything that had been disrupted seemed to be starting to settle. The narrative of recovery overriding the devastation. My grandmother had lost a lot of weight during her ordeal, but in the nursing home in Atlanta, she started eating again. My brother, too, seemed to be on his way to remaking his life. Even without his rental units, he was earning a living. There was a good deal of work to be had on the coast. Government contractors were hiring crews for the work of cleanup, and Joe was doing it all. I remember, too, that he called one day, excited about the possibility of a small business loan to rebuild his rental units, though later he'd learned that he did not qualify for assistance. Like a lot of people in North Gulfport, he wasn't eligible for the kinds of programs that had helped businesses and wealthier citizens get back on their feet. And it wasn't long before the initial cleanup was done, though recovery was still a long way off and still hasn't occurred for some of the poorest citizens in the region. Just more than a year after landfall, the contractors pulled out of Gulfport and other devastated Mississippi coastal towns, leaving behind much less work for people struggling to recover and rebuild their lives. Even the retail store Joe worked in part-time before the storm did not rebuild on the coast. The owners relocated the business farther north where they had family. Not only were jobs leaving the coast, much low-income housing had disappeared too and wasn't being rebuilt in the same numbers as before the storm, thus rendering recovery a lot harder to achieve for many of its citizens. I can't help thinking too that the photograph we made in 1992 foreshadowed something else. Driving through the old neighborhood not long ago, I remembered that my brother and I had waited in line to have it taken. The line had stretched around the dance floor, and we stood there with everyone else that night to pay the $5 to pose beneath those words, high rollers. It was as if we needed to get close to that image of luck and money in a place where so many people had so little. Perhaps it's better the photograph is lost. I know the desire to see the images of the past in light of the present would be too strong, and I'd be tempted to read into it, in our gestures, the way we held on to each other, what I would not see then, the irony of those words, how they mocked so many of the people who stood beneath them. The first letter my brother writes me during his incarceration arrives on August 13th, 2008, a week after we bury our grandmother. It comes bearing his name and his inmate number, R0470, along with a warning stamped in red that the letter is from an inmate and that the facility, the county jail where he awaits sentencing, is not responsible for content. He is as stoic in the letter as he was at the church the day of our grandmother's memorial service. I know things are hard right now. It seems like everything comes at one time. And I relive that morning while thinking of him trying to be strong in his cell. Perhaps because so much has happened in what seems like a short amount of time, I feel that I have gone through it as if I were walking through a set an artificial backdrop onto which our lives have been projected, along with a story that is already in process and beyond our control. I think of it now as not unlike the fake town at a dude ranch I visited when I was a child. The buildings were run down, mostly facades, and I was surprised the first time I saw the actors stage a shootout. My grandmother and I stood watching, at once part of the scene because we were there and not, as though we had walked into some bizarre turn of our lives and it was playing out right there before us and we were unable to stop it. 
The morning we buried our grandmother, the church was like that. Still in disrepair, the sanctuary unused, the church seemed abandoned. On the ground level, windows on both sides of the church were boarded up, and a couple of the high windows up top that overlooked the balcony were still blown out. I could see birds flying in and out of them. The church marquee hadn't been repaired, and most of the glass, were, glass was missing. A few letters hung on, an O on its side, what looked to be a broken F. Missing its smaller arm, it resembled the gallows in a child's game of hangman. Only the small bunker attached to the back of the church was functional. It was the place food was served after services, and it held Sunday school classrooms and a nursery. When I called to tell the caretaker, Mr. Crouch, that I was bringing my grandmother's body back to Gulfport to have her homegoing ceremony in the church she'd belonged to her whole life, he thanked me. Since the storm, we've lost a lot of our members, he said. Mount Olive is still struggling to raise the money for repairs that the insurance company didn't cover. Most people have moved on to places that aren't still in the process of rebuilding. Mr. Crouch, now in his early 80s, had done this job most of his life. I had arranged with him to have the doors opened early so Joe would be able to have some time with our grandmother. The sheriff had granted him permission to come, but only to a private viewing, and we had to schedule it two hours before anyone was supposed to arrive for the ceremony. My husband Brett and I arrived early, even before 8 a.m., when officers were scheduled to pick him up for transport. We didn't find anyone there when we arrived, no police car, so we decided to circle the block around the building in case they parked somewhere else. Turning the corner off Jefferson right in front of my grandmother's house onto the access road that runs parallel to Highway 49, we saw them. They were near the intersection of 49 and MLK, headed in the direction of the jail. I could see my brother's head just above the top of the back seat. When I saw the car's blinker come on, I panicked. It seems funny to me now that in moments like this, it becomes so easy to ignore the rules of traffic, of law and order on the road. I asked Brett to speed up, and he did, flashing the headlights and honking the horn as he pulled up close behind the police car. When they stopped, I got out and hurried toward the driver. Later, my brother would tell me that the two officers had been skeptical that because of the condition of the church, they hadn't believed any kind of services could be taking place there. As I stood in the middle of the road, afraid they were just going to take him back, I could see the officer in the passenger side looking at me, my black dress and stockings and shoes, while the other one chuckled. We're just going to get something to drink, he said. We'll bring him right back. We'd been told when our request to have Joe there was approved that we were not allowed to have any contact with him and that we'd have to stay back several feet from where he was. I didn't even look at him in the car. When the officers brought him back and parked near the entrance of the church's auxiliary building, Brett and I stood off to the side, away from the entrance. A few people had begun to arrive early, and I had to tell them they'd have to wait outside in the heat until the private viewing was over and Joe was gone. When he emerged from the car, I saw that his ankles were shackled and his hands were cuffed behind his back. I hadn't seen him like that before, and I stood there trying not to register any emotion on my face as I watched him walk into the church, flanked by the two officers. In my memory, this happens in slow motion, like a trite scene from a movie, and I feel like I notice everything, particularly the sound of his feet shuffling in the leg restraints, the birds flying out of the sanctuary and settling in the tree across the street, the whoosh of the door as Mr. Crouch opens it to let them in. When Joe is inside several feet, Brett and I follow, shutting the door behind us. The flowers haven't yet arrived, and the low-ceilinged room seems sparse, homely. Except for the fuse they've managed to salvage and the folding chairs where the choir will sit, the room holds only an organ, a small podium, and wooden chairs for the pastor and deacons, and the platform bearing the casket. Before Mr. Crouch shuts the door to the makeshift sanctuary, I can see Joe standing before the open casket, his head bowed. 
When Joe comes out a short while later, his eyes are red, and I look at him a good long moment, trying to make my face convey everything I am not allowed to say. Perhaps the officers are moved by all this, the grandson in restraints, the run-down church still wearing the vestiges of Katrina, the small congregation there to say goodbye to a woman who wanted nothing more than to come back home. During the homegoing ceremony, I can't help thinking of what recovery and rebuilding means in this little room dressed up to serve as the sanctuary. My grandmother had made the draperies that hung in the church, and she'd seen her own daughter eulogize before them. And yet, here she was, being remembered in a room that served as church cafeteria, beneath low ceiling tiles, warped and stained reminders that Katrina isn't over. As my niece PJ stood at the podium to remember her great-grandmother, I realized just how much she'd lost in this ordeal. And I imagine that for the rest of her life, she'd remember this time as underscored by the devastation of Katrina. She could mark the passing of her great-grandmother, the arrest of her father, the turmoil of these years as aftermath. People carry with them the blueprints of memory for a place. It is not uncommon to hear directions given in terms of landmarks that are no longer there. Turn right at the corner where the fruit stand used to be, or across the street from the lot where Miss Mary used to live. Some time ago, before the storm, my grandmother and I were shopping in Gulfport, and we met a friend of hers shopping with her granddaughter, too. The woman introduced the girl to us by her nickname, then quickly added the child's given name. My grandmother, a proud woman, not to be outdone, replied, well, Tasha's name is really Nostalgia. <laughs> Drawing the syllables out to make the name seem more exotic. I was embarrassed and immediately corrected her, not anticipating that the guilt I'd feel later could be worse than my initial chagrin. Perhaps she was trying to say Natalia, the formal version in Russian to which Natasha is the diminutive. At both names Latin root, the idea of nativity, of the birthday of Christ. They share a prefix with words like natal, national, and... Although it was very poetic prose, wasn't it? Yes, you know, it, it, it seemed too big, I think, in many ways. Um, too big for the, the kind of extended meditation that I wanted to do about the nature of historical memory, um, interwoven with uh, the history of the Mississippi Gulf Coast, as well as my family history. I, I had in mind um, Robert Penn Warren's Segregation, uh, the book that he published two years after the Brown decision, which was very much a, a travel narrative, where he journeys back to the South to rethink his own relationship to the place he comes from. Um, it, it, was a, it was a lovely model for me, a very slender book, but it helped me to figure out a way to tell this story that I didn't think I could tell in poetry. Yes. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, um, would you talk a little bit about your experience with Kaveh mm Kanu? -hmm. And then the second one is, um, oh, who are your favorite poets? <laughs> okay. Um, actually, uh, my very first book won uh, the first Cave Khan and Poetry Prize, which is how uh, it got published, uh, uh, something I'm deeply grateful for because it allowed uh, all of a sudden an audience. You know, I, I thought I would never get a book published, so it was, it was great that Cave Khanum came along for black poets to send their work to. I'm actually going to be there as faculty for the first time next summer, um, so it feels like I get to give back, you know, to this place. Um, I forgot your other question. Oh, my favorite poets. <laughs> you know, there's so many, and you know it's always changing. Um, but the easiest thing uh, that I can say, uh, uh, at least about um, my last book, is that I found a great kinship with Irish poets uh, because of their relationship to homeland and history. So, for example, uh, the work of Evan Boland and Seamus Heaney, uh, particularly his book North, I, the engagement with history, that sense of psychological exile, of course, uh, 
the, the first book that my father gave me that I carried around as my literary Bible when I was first starting to write poems was Rita Dove's Thomas and Beulah. Uh, I added to that Komanyaka's Magic City. So uh, if, you, if you take Heaney's North, Evan Boland's uh, In a Time of Violence and the Lost Land, and Thomas and Beulah and Magic City, those are my literary ancestors, at least most immediately. <laughs> Hi, uh, Mr. Soy. Uh, in your book, Native Guard, there are quite a few poems in form, mm -hmm. as well as freer forms. And I was wondering if you could comment on, well, your, your thoughts on how form can still be relevant for poets today. Because you hear a lot of people still saying, oh, you know, form is for 50 years ago. You can't use that. So. Yes, yes. I, I have been told that I'm old-fashioned because of that. Um, I can't imagine that I could write about some of the difficult things I try to write about without uh, the the um, scaffolding of form. Uh, for me, it's it's a way of imposing a very necessary restraint. Um, I found that um, I, I know a lot of writers will say this that um, some they turn to form for the most difficult material. But form is of course memorable. I mean that's not to say that. Um, free verse writers haven't invented their own sort of memorable cadences in poems that we love and recite. But there is something about uh, the memorable nature of uh, poems in traditional forms, those cadences, those rhymes. And in Native Guard, because I was trying to remember, trying to reinscribe things that had been forgotten, um, I realized that I needed that scaffolding of form to, to try to create something memorable. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I'm from Pascagoula a long time hey, ago, yeah. and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Um, the same. I am a long time Gulfport native, lived in New Orleans for a while, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's nice to have the hometown folks, y'all, because, yeah, you know, people... I mean, you guys know the story. I mean, so much of the media did turn to the, the, the travesty of New Orleans with good reason, but it, it's a different story. And the people I talk to on the Mississippi Gulf Coast want the nation to remember the difference between the man-made uh, disaster of New Orleans and the natural disaster that hit the Gulf Coast. Um, and those towns all along the coast, uh, ground zero for Hurricane Katrina's landfall devastation. Well, thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.